I got to the camp on uh, last Sabbath morning. I had to stay uh, about half an hour away where the closest motel was. And uh, everyone in our group was saying, Pastor Dan, it's forecast is for rain at 5 o'clock. What are you going to do with 49,000 people out under the rain? We spent really, every, every club was wrestling what to do, what to do. Some clubs just decided pack up, get in their bus, and go. Our group finally decided we are pathfinders, we can handle a little rain. And we prayed. And the Tongan pastor, he's preaching at Tongan church today, is not here. He said, Pastor Dan, it will not rain. I have prayed. I said, it never rains on you in Tonga? Are you kidding me? A little island in the ocean? You pray and it never rains on any of your events? Never, Pastor Dan. All right. Five o'clock, came and went. Cloud was dark, no rain. Six o'clock, no rain. <laughs> Seven o'clock, we all began to go over there. A few had left, but there were still 45, 46,000 people there. We're sitting there. About 7.40, they got up there, and they had two pastors, including Sam Lenore from La Sierra, stand up there and pray that God would keep the rain away. I wasn't sure how this works. Didn't work in the Philippines too good with our evangelism. <laughs> Rained every night. I came back, and Sarah May and Silvino said that they were there at the last one when they prayed, and a tornado went around the camp and was, they were safe. And I said, okay, what about the rain? And so after the prayer, they began to go, and the program and the music and the videos and all the rest, and then they got to the drama, which was just fantastic. On the book of Daniel, I hope we can find some links and you all can see it. Every night was just off the charts how good this was. Better than glory of Christmas or any of it. And in the heart of the message, 10 minutes before they were done, it began to sprinkle. Our kids got sleeping bag on top of them. I had my hat and had my bag. And it began to get a little worse and a little worse. People began to get up and go. Finally, Sandra said, Pastor Dan, we've got to go. The kids are frozen and soaked. They were, I was going to make it to the end. But finally, it was just too much. Freezing cold, soaking wet. I said, okay, I think I know what Pastor Sam was going to say. I'm going to go. And got in the car. Why? Couldn't God keep the rain from coming 20 more minutes after a whole week? While they're doing a drama on God protecting Daniel in the lion's den, he can't stop the rain? He can stop the lion's mouth, but he can't stop the rain? Does God still do miracles? Is he still doing Jonah and the whales and Jericho's walls come tumbling down? Or is he just into forgiving and taking you to heaven, but there's no more stopping the rain? Challenging question we're wrestling with this camp meeting as we look at some of these great miracles of the Bible. If you have a Bible you'd like to join with us, we're doing Joshua chapter 1 today. After the death of Moses... God came and he said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, to cross the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. God is saying to Joshua and the children of Israel, over there, over the river, is the promised land. Back there is Egypt. That was slavery. You are not going to be in slavery anymore. You have got to go to your promised land. I am giving it to you. You're not going to have to fight. I will do it for you. But you cannot stop here on the banks and just sit here. You have to cross over and claim your promised land. And your concept of land, not just where you live, that is who you are. And he says, where you were in Egypt, that is not who you are. That is not who I called you to be, to be in slavery. Don't let anybody do that to you anymore. You are not that. I have called you to promised land. That is who you are. Claim your new identity and cross over. Most of you know that uh, 
our son moved away and now is in Arizona teaching PE at the school in Arizona. Hilda had to work the day they left, and so uh, I had to help pack up their little U-Haul truck, kind of pathetic, these few little things. I said, someday you'll have some more, but here, a few little things in a U-Haul truck. And then there came the moment. One was going to drive the truck, one was going to drive the car. And I called the two to come and have a little prayer. I couldn't get through the prayer. This moment that you've been working for all your lives is to educate them for 16, 17 years so they would be able to get a job. And he gets the job of his dreams. And now I can't let him go. And I got through that prayer finally. And I stood there and videoed as he drove down and went around the corner. Go back into an empty house. Why was it hard? I suppose part of it was because we're done now, mostly. Whatever we've done now is what he will be. We can't go back and redo any of it. We have to just live with whatever we did in those 23 years. That's it. But as I thought about it, part of what is hard is what will he do now with his life? We got him to here. Now what will he do? Will he, will he take this chance and do something with it? Will he love those kids at that school? Will he work hard? Will they have great lesson plans? Will he learn? Will he go to other coaches and take the best of their ideas? Will he have worship with all those teams? He has nine sports. Will he somehow lead those kids to know God better? Will he be the Leslie Aragon of Thunderbird Academy? How close to his potential will he come? And God says, you were not made for Egypt. You were made for your promised land. When the boys were little, we would drive the, through a construction zone. And there would be one guy there with a little sign, a stop and go sign. They didn't want to go to school. They didn't want to do math. And I would say, you don't want to study? That, maybe you could have that job someday, that stop and go. <laughs> or I would drive by the real estate signs on Sunday where those guys are doing their signs. I said, well, maybe you could do that job, you know. <laughs> one night we were at La Sierra watching the uh, a recital of some kind, piano player. And uh, before the main guy came, another kid came out to adjust the stool. Everyone clapped because they thought that was the piano player. No, he was just setting the stool for the piano. And I said to the boys, you know, maybe if you study and practice hard, you could be the chair setup guy, you know, for the piano. <laughs> we went to the Nutcracker Ballet one time. A friend of ours was dancing in the play. And there came a moment in the place there in Riverside where they had to dump the snow. And so somebody was up there in the rafters that had a little crank, and you had to crank the crank at the right moment and let the snow come up. And maybe you could study hard. You could be that guy up in the rafters. And in three hours, you have one moment where you let the snow out. You can either play in the game or you can be the guy selling the peanuts for the people to watch the game. Which are you going to be? Are you going to reach your potential? What are you going to do with all of this? I do not know if God moves a rain around still or not. But I absolutely believe this, that God has a promised land for every one of you. Amen? That there is a promised land. It is not just mentions up in heaven up there someday. It is right here and down here where there is a promised land that God has for you to do. And that while I cannot answer exactly where God will work with all the miracles, and maybe God does not always stop the rain, but God is still able to move people from Egypt to the promised land, from slavery to where God has potential, what he has designed for you to do. And God can keep move you from wherever you used to be, and he can take you all the way to the promised land he has prepared. He said, I will give you the land. I will drive out the giants. I will make the walls come tumbling down. God is still able to do that. Amen? That's what we believe. You may have to march around the walls. You may have to blow your trumpets. You may have to do a few things. But the rest of it, God says, I will do it. I will drive. I am giving you the land. I promise it to Moses. Everywhere you go, that will be your land. If you'll just let me do it for you. Go claim your promised land. Here's the hard question. How do you know where your promised land is? What's the answer? Where the giants are. You know what the text says? 
where the giants are, that is probably where your promised land is. If it's easy, then it's probably not your promised land. If there's no strength, that is probably not your promised land. If it doesn't stretch you, if it doesn't scare you to death, it doesn't almost sink you, it is not your promised land. That is easy. Staying in Egypt is easy. Sitting on the banks is easy. But to go claim your promised land, that's where the giants are. But if you want to accomplish something in life, if you want to leave a legacy for the world, those things that really matter, there's usually some giants there. And God wants you to go there. You go to the NBA. You don't know where the basket is? That's where the tallest guys are. Short guys are out there. On front. They put the tallest guys back there to block the basket. Who do they let use their hands in soccer? The goalie. Don't let the ball go in that goal. We used to have a game in Singapore in high school. They called the tire pole. Whenever the boys were getting a little rusty, the dean would say, okay, we're having a tire pole. It was everything goes. There was no rules. You grab guys, tackle guys, whatever you could do. And you had to get all that team's tires over to your side and don't lose your tires. And my team chose the biggest, fattest, heaviest guy on our team. And where do we put him? He went back and sat on all of our tires. <laughs> you move our tires, you got to move him first. We didn't lose a single tire. We put our best guy there. And Satan, he doesn't put his giants around Egypt. He doesn't put his giants here on the bank of the river. He puts his giants around where God has a promised land for you. And he says, you want what God wants to give you? Then you're going to have to come through my giants first. You want to know where God wants you to be. It's not the easy ones. It's where the big ones are, the hard ones, where the giants are. And he says, I can give you that. The famous story, I'll just tell as quick as I can. For you teachers, maybe others of you need to hear this story for kids and their potential. There's a famous parable of the sea lion. It was in his little place where he was playing. He was far from any sea. He was like a little mud puddle, really. had one little tree above him. But at night, once in a while, he would crawl up on the rock and he would get a little sniff of the sea, the air from the sea. And he would dream of being in the sea with other sea lions and cavorting and diving in the sea. Then he would wake up and here he was in this mud puddle again. And he said to the other animals, I don't think this is the sea. I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in the sea. He said, no, no, that's the sea. I don't think this can be the sea. And once in a while, he would get up on the rock at night and he would get a sniff of the sea again. Well, the story goes, one time there was a windstorm for 40 days and 40 nights. And the wind came and he put his head down and he covered his eyes because the dust was blowing. And after 40 days and 40 nights, there was no more tree, there was no more leaves. And all the water was gone from the mud puddle. And he decided this could not be the sea. He began as a sea lion to flip, use his flippers to walk across the desert. And the owl said, where are you going? I am going to the sea. No, this is the sea. No, that is not the sea. I was made for the sea. And God has a promised land for you. Yes, it may be hard. It's where the giants are. But that is where you will receive the best of what God wants you to be in this world. Amen. And I ask you teachers who are here today and all the rest of you parents, what does this have to do with you today? God has called you to be Joshua's. And God has called you to stand in front of a room of children. And your mission is to describe to them what their promised land is to cross over the Jordan. To give them a little idea of who they are called to be. That they cannot accept the Egypt of slavery. They cannot accept sitting here on the bank. You must give them a vision of who they will be someday if they will go to their own promised land. You cannot spend too much time talking about their past and their mistakes and their Egypt and slavery. You are called by God to be a Joshua to say, there is your promised land. Cross on over. Don't just stop here. Do not accept mediocrity or average. God has given you something great. Go and God will drive out the giants and he will give you a promised land. And have them reach their potential for God. That is why we have Christian schools. That's why we have you there for that. 
I was sitting next to our kids. In one of those dramas, I was sitting next to June, the one that just got baptized. She's in sixth grade. And I just said to her, I said, someday, five years from now, you can be at the next uh, Oshkosh, and you could be up there on that stage doing the drama or be part of the singer. She said, oh, Pastor Dan, I could not. No, no. I said, yes, you can. All of them up there were you at one time. You could do that. And that's our mission is to give kids a sense of the dream of what they can be. Not just a heavenly promised land someday, but the promised land that God has for them down here. Number two, we go on to verses 10 and 11. Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In these days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. In three days. All the way through the Bible, there are these three days. You have to wait two days, and then on the third day, God is going to do something. Esther sends a note out to Mordecai, pray and fast for two days. On the third day, I will go in before the king. And Jonah's down in the whale for three days, does not know if he's ever going to come out again. And on the third day, God puts him out onto dry land. And Mount Sinai, God shouted down, he said, you prepare yourself, you wash your clothes, you get ready, and then on the third day you come, and I will come down and I will speak to you. The cupbearer who was in jail with Joseph, Joseph says, on the third day you will go back to the king and you will serve the king again. And then, of course, Jesus dies and is in the grave, and on the third day he comes walking out. All the way through the Bible, there's a band that calls himself the third day. The third day is the day when God comes down and acts. For the two days, God makes you wait. And he wants you to pray, and he wants you to stay faithful, and he wants you to keep watching and waiting. And if you will stay faithful and stay in the game, then the third day, God will come. And on the third day, queens go walking in before the king, and whales go spitting out the prophet. And prisoners walk out of jail and stones begin to move away from a tomb, and Jesus, the God of heaven, walks out of his grave. Amen? We are third-day people. God is coming. So if sometimes you're struggling through the first two days, know that on the third day, God is coming. And now we come to the heart of this passage. You move down to chapter 3. And it says in chapter 3, verse 13, as they got to the river, as soon as their feet touched the water, the flow of water will be cut off spring, upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. The river is flooded. This is the third day. Now they are ready to go across. And they line up all of Israel, and here are the priests standing there in the front. You know the story. And God says to those priests, you put your foot in the water, and you step in, and the water will open up, just like it did 40 years ago. The experts say this is not exactly like the Philippines where you can just walk in and 100 yards later you've only gone knee deep. The experts say this was like a drop off of maybe 15 or 20 feet at this area where this was. John Ortberg preaching about this, he says, I think maybe these guys who were in the front said, I think I was in the front yesterday. I think this is your turn now. And most of us say to God, you open up the land first, God, and then I'll step. You first, God. <laughs> you first, God. No, God says, you step in first, and then I'll do it. I want to see you put some faith in me and who I am. We say to God, no, you give me more time, I'll read the Bible more. You give me more money, God, then I'll put more tithes and offerings. And you help me win the lottery, God. Then I'll pay all that up. Talk to someone this week. Bargaining with God. Buying all these little trinkets. <laughs> trying to win the publisher's clearinghouse. And she said, if, if God would just do it, I'll pay everybody. I'll pay all the church settings off. You first, God. You first, God. You make it obvious for me, then I will believe. You answer all my questions, then I won't doubt anymore. God says, no, you step into the water first. We say, God, you change my wife, then I'll love her the way you want me to. <laughs> you, 
You fix my kids and then I'll be a better parent. You quit having them, you make them better, I'll quit getting angry with them. You first, God. You first, God. You uh, show me the signs of the times at the end of the world and then I'll get going to church every week. When I see the Sunday law, God, you first. Then I see the Sunday law, then I'll get really serious and I'll put my, all my life into your hands. You first, God. God says, no, you first. You take the first step. I have begged God hundreds of times to go first. I have raised money for projects all over the world. They scare me to death every single time. I would sit there in the van in the Philippines just a month ago. People would give me another project. Pastor Dan, this church. How about my church? My church. I just could not. I would sit there in the front seat, agonizing, where could I go? I would, God, you send me the money, then I will build the churches. You send me the money, and I'll use it, and I'll do the best I can. God, send me the money first. Send me the money, I'll put the money for the kids at the school. You send it first, God. No, you do first. Over and over again. It is an agonizing time, that first step into the water. But God says, if you'll honor me and step first, I will open up the water and you will walk across to your promised land. That's what he promises. And I ask you today, what is your Jordan? I listened to Sam Lenore preach on this years ago and I took his line from this sermon. I don't know what your Jordan is. Everybody has one, a bank you're sitting on. Looking across to what God really wants us to do, to what he wants us to be. And we say, not right now, God. I'm happy. I'm comfortable here right now. Maybe God wants you to go back to school so that you don't just stop here on the bank. This is not your destiny. No, you don't want to go back to Egypt, but neither are you really going to your destiny. There's giants there and you don't want to go more comfortable here. But no, go across. Go back to school and become who you really are supposed to be. Don't accept something short of that. Maybe God has some project for you, some ministry. Maybe he wants you to go on our next mission trip. Maybe there's something he wants to get out of your life. It's just getting in the way. It's in Egypt. It's bogging, bogging, bogging you down, keeping you from your promised land. What's your Jordan River today? that God would like to take out. It may be very, very small. It may seem silly to you. At 2 o'clock this morning, I was hanging things up, hung up a suit, and my finger just caught the wood on the pole, and a sliver went in my finger. It's 2 in the morning, God, I don't need this. White paint everywhere from this thing. So I had to get the tweezers out and alcohol and trying to get this out so it won't get infected. Couldn't get it out. I got up this morning with this sermon and a baptism today and a wedding tonight and a Sabbath school class. I said, God, I can't have this get infected. And I just prayed one more time. I hate needles. I hate pain. I hate all of it. <laughs> I got to get this out, God. Can you just help me? I got a light and I got it out. Thank you very much. It may be very small, but it's a giant and you need God to come through for you. But I'm going to give you one more. I could tell you stories of buildings and financial projects. But I'm going to tell you today about a person. That was part of my promised land in the last few years. We have a lady in our church who's a wonderful lady. She is our decorator. She is the one that has helped us design the lobby. She's done the office part, all the rest. Fantastic art mind. She's married to someone who I love and uh, just thought was terrific. And I asked her, is it okay if I try to uh, get him toward the church? Oh, Pastor Dan, be careful, be careful. She didn't want to rock the boat. She didn't want to make anything more complicated. They figured out their deal. Comes to church every week. So for a while, I just shook hands. How are you doing? How are you doing? A couple of years ago, I got an idea. I was writing a set of Bible studies and, uh, with the computer, and I wrote the one on the Bible. And I said to him, I said, I need somebody who doesn't already believe to listen to this Bible study so I can test it out to see if it works. Is that clever? 
You'll be my beta test. So can I buy you a Thai dinner and you listen to my Bible study? Yeah, Pastor Dan, that's okay. We went to the Thai restaurant, gave my Bible study. He said, if you'd like to do more, I didn't bite. Six months later, I wrote a lesson on Jesus and the believing in Jesus. He doesn't believe. He didn't believe Islam. He didn't believe Christianity. He didn't believe anything. So we went to the Persian restaurant. And I gave him the Bible study on Jesus. Interesting. Asked a couple questions. Nothing. Giants in the land. <laughs> finally, finally, we were talking one time and I said, are you sort of hoping that if there is a God and if there is a heaven, that somehow he will let you in as long as you've been a good guy, haven't hurt anybody, haven't done anything really seriously wrong, that it'll be okay. He said, yeah, that's, I guess that's about where I am. <laughs> And somehow this came out of me, first time in 40 years. Never said this to anybody. I said, let me just tell you, heaven is about God. It is not, first of all, just about being good and for good people. It is for people who want to be with God. It is for people who want to be with Jesus. There will not be worship services in heaven where a few billion people all go down the road to this great stadium to worship God. And here's one little suburb over here on the side where nobody believes in God and they're just there with their mansions and TV. They're in heaven, but not with God. There will not happen. No one will get off the train in heaven. And here is Jesus standing there to hug everyone who comes in. And some people just walk right on by to go to their mansion. No, every single person who goes to heaven will be hugging Jesus and worshiping Jesus. No one will say no when there's a chance to go worship God. Doing good and being good will not get you into heaven. Heaven is Jesus. And one giant got knocked down. And he accepted Bible studies. And we have gone down to the Thai restaurant here every Thursday night for many months. I finished all the lessons. No decision. I thought of a couple more things I could do. No decision. <laughs> I said, do you have any questions? Well, I do have a couple questions. We had a couple more dinners for that. I'm getting a lot of Thai dinners out of this. And finally, I couldn't think of another thing to do. I finally said, I have given you everything I have. And now it's between you and God. And three weeks ago, his wife stood with me out in the lobby and she said, if you'll baptize him in the ocean, he'll get baptized. And he is getting baptized at 3 o'clock today. Amen? Would you stand where you are, Bob Evans and Linda? They're here today. Would you give them a hand? Amen. One of my favorite people in the world. Isn't that good? We could tell all the stories. You could tell your stories. God is still, I don't know if he will move the rain around, but God is still in the business of moving people from Egypt to the promised land. And one more is going to step over and go over the Jordan River today at 3 o'clock. I hope some of you will come and bless him with that. So I'd like to ask you today, what is your Jordan? What is it that God has put on your heart? You know you need to go there. I know what mine is. I don't know what yours is. Something that might be a little scary and there's some giants there and you're sort of sitting on the banks of the Jordan. Don't really want to go. You want to go back to Egypt, but neither do you want to go yet to the promised land. And God says to you today, go on across. I will take care of those giants and I will knock down the walls of the city and I will give you the promised land that you were made for. Amen? And now hear what God said to Joshua and the children of Israel. Would you stand and read these verses with me as they come onto the screen? Would you stand where you are? Repeat these verses to yourself and let them come into your soul. Joshua 1, I will never leave you or forsake you. Joshua 1, 6, be strong and courageous. Joshua 1, 7, be strong and very courageous. And now Joshua 1, 9, 
Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be seated. <clears throat> 